Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining NAOIC today. We are so glad to have you. I'm Lauren Hogan, the Senior Director for Public Policy and Advocacy at NAYC. And we are delighted to have you join us today as we release some new market research that we've conducted with educators working with children in kindergarten through third grade. With this data, we're pleased to mark another extensive round of research that has, over the last three years, deepened our collective understanding about the perspectives of American voters, parents, and educators themselves about how to advance and support high quality early childhood education and the early childhood education profession. At the close of today's webinar, you'll be able to find today's research added to NAYC's website at www.naeyc.org slash profession, along with our prior data and findings all of which we have used to inform the intersecting work around policy, practice, and the power to the profession initiative. We would like to extend, extend our special gratitude for the generous support of the Richard W. Goldman Family Foundation, which has made each step of this research possible, as well as the teams from FM3 and Public Opinion Strategies. They've conducted this research as a powerful bipartisan team that has shared insight, strategy, and messaging to help move us forward. And to that end, I'm delighted to welcome Dave Metz from FM3 and Lori Weigel from Public Opinion Strategies as presenters for today's webinar. We're looking forward to an engaging presentation and a robust conversation with you to follow. We invite you to ask questions throughout, which we'll answer at the end using the comment box at the bottom of your screen. And now, it's my great pleasure to introduce Rian evans Alvin, NAYC's Chief Executive Officer, to kick us off. Thanks, Lauren, and I add my appreciation in particular to Lauren, who from a, a staff perspective has um, spearheaded this work and made sure the findings were translated and in a way that um, our, the field could digest and our partners could um, really dig into. So thanks, Lauren, for your incredible work, and also to Dave and Lori, who have been our partners in this market research now since 2015, and we would not be where we were, are with Power to the Profession without that bipartisan team with us, as well as the Richard W. Goldman Found Family Foundation, whose generous support has enabled us to do this market research so we know and understand the field and what we're working with in order to move forward. So today is Teacher Appreciation Day, uh, and we're so glad to be able to share this data today in honor and celebration of the incredible educators who lift up children, families, and communities each and every day. Our first market research back in 2015 showed that nearly 90% of American voters value early childhood educators as heroes, seeing them as important members of the community on par with firefighters and nurses, and we couldn't agree more. But there's so much happening behind this sentiment. How does our country show that we value early childhood educators? Who are early childhood educators? And what images come to mind when we say these words? To that end, I'll be the first to admit that I've been really excited about this particular set of data for a while. The scientific research summarized so beautifully in the National Academies of Medicine Transforming the Workforce Report confirms the critical nature of each year from birth through age eight and views them together as a coherent and unified stage of life. NAEYC's organizational commitments reflect this understanding of early childhood education as birth through age eight, as does our collective Power to the Profession initiative with 14 other partner organizations. Yet, we all struggle with translating the science and organizational commitment into policy and practice. We all know that too often, as a result of our national and state policies, practices, habits, and funding streams, the educators working across the years from birth through age eight are separated by issues of professional preparation to accountability, to compensation. One of the ways we're challenging this current reality is to elevate early childhood educators' voices, helping them serve as the foundation for the decision-making efforts to define and advance the entirety of the early childhood education profession. I want to pause for just a moment to hear some of those voices in this video.
The biggest impact that I think I make as an early childhood educator is I help get to ignite the joy of learning from a young age and get children um, really excited about school. Sparking that something inside of them that makes them realize, oh, I can do this and I can change the world, that I think is my biggest asset as an early childhood educator. I am helping um, develop children in life, not just their um, education. Um, I'm teaching them how to, uh, teaching them social skills, teaching them how to read, how to write, um, things that are important for the rest of their life. This work of elevating teacher voice is part and parcel with the vision of our strategic direction in which we state clearly that our aim is to ensure that children, birth through age eight, have equitable access to developmentally appropriate, high quality early learning. While we also work towards a world in which the early education profession exemplifies excellence and is recognized as vital and performing a critical role in society. Within these broader goals, we aim to achieve certain results. Among those are that there is a defined set of agreed upon skills, knowledge, competencies, and qualifications for the early childhood education profession. And relatedly, that developmentally appropriate practice is seen as indispensable for kindergarten through third grade. This research has those goals squarely in sight and is at its core about delving into the heart of the question about whether and to what extent educators working in kindergarten through third grade are seen as and see themselves as part of a coherent early childhood education profession that encompasses all of the years from birth through age eight. We wanted to, we wanted to know how do K3 educators feel about the current state of their work? What are the challenges and successes? In what ways do K3 educators feel like early childhood educators? What do they value most from their professional preparation and what do they think is missing? Do K3 educators want to be part of a unified profession with educators of children ages three and four and birth to three? What advocacy messages do they respond to and in what ways might they engage as advocates? Without giving too much away, I'll just say that the answers to the questions revealed through this research give me a lot of hope for a future that looks different in ways that will benefit children, families, educators, and the, and the systems that support them. And with that, I'd like to thank you all again for joining us and turn the presentation over to Dave Metz, principal and co-founder of FM3, to walk us through the data. Dave? All right, thank you very much, Rian, and uh, a big thanks to NAEYC and to the Richard W. Goldman Family Foundation for sponsoring this research. Uh, we are very excited to be with you today to share what we found. There's a lot of interesting findings that I think illuminate um, both what K-3 through teachers think in their own right, but also draw some interesting comparisons between their views of their work and that of uh, early childhood educators and also of parents of young children. Um, and in many cases, we see a lot of harmony between uh, what those different levels of, of educators and what parents think and what they would like to see happen in order to um, create a stronger future for early education uh, in America. So we're going to walk through the results of the research. Um, there were two phases to the uh, research that we conducted with K-3 through teachers. We started with a set of online qualitative interviews with 14 educators across the country where we asked a series of open-ended and in-depth questions to understand the things that uh, they liked about their profession, the things that they viewed as challenges, and some of their hopes and aspirations for the future. Hearing them talk about their work in their own words was very, very helpful for us in writing a survey questionnaire um, that would speak to the, the concerns and the aspirations that educators have. And those findings helped us develop an online survey, which we administered to a nationally representative sample of 537 teachers who either currently or recently taught in uh, K through three. 
Our sample was drawn from multiple sources. Obviously, there is no single database of K-3 through teachers across the country. And for that reason, we compiled a, a variety of different sources, NAEYC's membership database, um, a variety of partner organizations that represent teachers across the country, um, and some commercial databases that maintain lists of teachers as well. And through harmonizing those uh, different sources, we were able to come up with a solid nationally representative sample. There are also a number of places in the data where you will note that we compare the results of this current research with previous surveys that we conducted for NAEYC among uh, different populations. A survey that was conducted in 2017 among uh, early childhood educators and then a 2016 survey of parents. We didn't ask exactly the same questions in each survey because obviously the audiences were slightly different and the context changed. But the basic substance of many of the questions was the same, and it allows us to draw some interesting comparisons between the viewpoints of these different audiences. Uh, one final note, the reason why there are uh, two pollsters on the phone today, I'm joined by my colleague Lori Weigel with Public Opinion Strategies, is that uh, in our work on public policy and political issues, our firms work on different sides of the political aisle. When my firm polls in candidate races, we poll for Democrats. When Lori's firm polls, she polls for Republicans. Um, and given the partisan nature of much of our public policy debate these days, um, the two of us come together and try to craft research and analyze the results of that research from a bipartisan perspective um, to make sure that we're um, gathering data that's going to be representative of opinions across the spectrum of political ideology in our country today. So with that, let's find out a little bit about what we learned. Um, first, just a little bit of, about the profile of the K-3 through teachers we talked to. Uh, most of our respondents were teachers who had been in the profession for a while, at least a decade, and three-quarters of that number indicated that they intend to stay in the profession over the long term. On the left-hand side of this slide, you'll see the, the varying tenures of the different teachers that we talked to. And on the right-hand side, the results of a question where we asked them to rate their intentions of teaching in early elementary grades over the long term. Uh, we used a 0 to 100 scale where 100 meant uh, that they definitely would do so, 0 meant they definitely would not, and, and 50 was a midpoint. And as you'll see, 83% uh, of the respondents rated their score over 50, indicating an intention to stay, including 2 in 5 who rated the score between a 91 and 100, indicating a real uh, commitment to the profession. And the overall average score was a 76. So that's a little bit about who we talked to. Um, now we'll turn to their perceptions of why they are an early childhood uh, educator and, and why early elementary education is something that's important to them. Uh, one question that delved into this offered the respondents a list of different aspects of their work that they might view as uh, with varying degrees of importance and asked them to rate each one as either extremely, very, somewhat, or not important to their job as an early elementary uh, teacher. We had asked a similar question of the early childhood educators in the survey that we had conducted the previous year. And you'll see here a remarkable consistency between the responses of those two levels of educators. Uh, more than 7 in 10 say that feeling good about the impact they're having on children in the community is extremely important to their work, as is working with dedicated and supportive coworkers at just over 60%, and then for about half, having a work schedule that allows them to spend time with their family and working in a field where they can grow and improve. By far, the thing that they seem to appreciate most about their work at both levels is that engagement with the community in the sense that they are making a positive contribution to the lives of young children. And when we had a series of questions that teased out um, the things that they most like and dislike about their day-to-day -day work, it reflected some of these same priorities. The things that K-3 teachers enjoy most about the work they do is watching children grow and achieve um, and observing their love of learning um, and teaching uh, foundational uh, education. The things that they dislike, however, have more to do with the environment in which they work as opposed to their interactions with the children. Um, the demands placed on teachers, uh, inappropriate standards, and low pay. Although some also noted that the children at, at this young age are less independent and that that can occasionally pose a challenge as well. When we put a finer point on it and asked the respondents to quantify what they saw as the biggest challenges that they uh, face as early elementary teachers, um, the category of items that stood out most had to do with 
administrative requirements that are imposed upon them, as opposed to things that dealt with their interaction with children and the actual work of teaching. Uh, you'll see here the items that the respondents were most likely to rate as a big challenge, which includes, in the blue bars on the left, items that they said were one of the biggest challenges that they face. Uh, totaling the blue and the, and the red bars will give you the total proportion that, that identified these items as a big challenge. And you'll note that the top three items, which at least seven in 10 K through three teachers rated as a big challenge, all have to do with administrative requirements. Too much focus on assessment and testing, too many standards and regulations, too much paperwork and bureaucracy. Uh, low pay follows not far behind with 65% identifying it as a, a big challenge. And then lack of autonomy and lack of respect from parents close out the top tier of items that majorities rate as being a big challenge. Lower on the list, we see items that no more than half of K through three teachers rated as a big challenge. Doesn't mean these aren't things that they occasionally view as obstacles to, to doing their work, but in relative terms, they're just not seen as being uh, as big an obstacle. Um, things like difficulty of the work schedule, uh, lack of mentoring and career guidance, lack of opportunities for ongoing education and training. For those items a little bit lower down there, it's only about a quarter to a third that are identifying them as a big challenge. Now these perceptions are not uniform across the profession. There are differences in the ways that uh, different kinds of K-3 through teachers with different levels of experience and, and backgrounds view some of these issues. And perhaps some of the biggest differences came between more and less experienced teachers. Um, as you'll see on the left-hand side, teachers with less uh, experience tend to view the bureaucracy and paperwork as less of a challenge. Um, the teachers who have been in the profession the longest perhaps come to feel a little bit more burdened by some of those requirements um, and are much more likely to say that those things are the biggest challenges they face. In contrast, less experienced teachers are more likely to point to lack of respect from parents as an obstacle, something which perhaps more experienced teachers over time uh, become better able to, to manage and, uh, and handle. Um, now, over there is a number of other areas where we see some differences. Um, teachers with incomes below $60,000, those on the lower end of the scale, uh, are ones where low pay is one of the things that they see as a particularly big challenge. Not surprisingly, uh, the teachers who are paid less are more likely to cite that as a particular concern. And here you'll see the results of a question in which the respondents were asked to in their own words, describe some of these challenges. And while the nature of the items that they're pointing to as being problematic may be uh, sort of the same as the broad categories we were just looking at, I think you get a feel for the way they talk about it and the way they describe some of the challenges that they encounter uh, in their work. Um, now, this question was also one which we posed to in our survey of uh, early childhood educators in 2017. And while the, the sort of categories of items that they raise as challenges are fairly similar, there were a few places where there were significant distinctions between the K through three educators and the early childhood educators. And in particular, it's the two that you see at the top of the list. The paperwork and bureaucracy, which K through three educators saw as one of their biggest challenges, um, is also a concern for a majority of early childhood educators, but it's about 12 points lower. The distinction in pay, however, is uh, enormous. The early childhood educators, it's 84% who see low pay as an obstacle, ranking by far as their number one concern. And while it's high on the list for K through three educators as well, it's almost 20 points lower. Um, so there certainly are some distinctions uh, uh, in terms of the uh, severity that the uh, educators see in relative terms, uh, depending on the circumstances in which they're working. Now we also explored teachers' attitudes toward the preparation that they get for their profession. And by and large, they were satisfied with the training that they had received uh, before starting their work as a teacher. 87% rated their training as either excellent or pretty good. I will note, though, that the proportion who rated it as excellent, reflecting a really high degree of satisfaction, was modest. It was just under one-third of K-3 through teachers. So there are positive feelings, but they aren't particularly strongly felt. 
And it was striking that here we didn't see a great deal of difference based on how long the teachers had been working, um, nor on the uh, amount of formal education that they had before entering the profession. Um, in each case, their evaluations of their training and preparation was about the same. There were a number of different elements of training that they rated as being particularly more or less important. The items that they saw as most helpful were having opportunities to observe and assist in a real classroom and getting some training in child development. Majorities of K-3 through educators labeled those as very helpful. Uh, there were a number of items that just under half rated as being uh, very helpful for them, and those included literary, literacy instruction, math instruction, and then classroom management. There's an array of other uh, types of preparation that the teachers received that tended to rank a little bit lower on the scale, with smaller numbers indicating that they were very helpful. And for a number of these, uh, there were actually more teachers who rated it as not helpful or said they had not received that kind of training than said it was very helpful. And that includes the top four items that you'll see on this slide. Um, at least 34% uh, indicated that uh, they either had not received or found it unhelpful the uh, uh, preparation they had gotten using data to inform instruction in family engagement in classroom technology or working with dual language learners in each case we only had about a quarter of teachers at most that told us that their preparation in those areas had been very helpful and uh, perhaps not surprisingly, when we ask people which areas they wish they had received more training in, it corresponds fairly directly to those areas where they felt like their training was not adequate enough. Classroom management, uh, working with children with special needs, dual language learners, and classroom technology all were cited by at least three in 10 K-3 through teachers as an area where they wished they had more preparation. Now, um, the uh, importance of preparation and training is really underscored by the fact that there was a close correlation between the degree of, of preparation and the satisfaction with, with the preparation that teachers received and then their stated intent to stay in the profession over the long term. The more happy teachers were with their preparation and training, the more likely they say they were to stay uh, in that profession over the long term. And you'll see some of the numbers in the lower left-hand side that demonstrate that correlation. Um, it's also worth noting that teachers of color were more likely to say it was helpful to have training in working with students of diverse backgrounds. Um, obviously, that uh, may be something that uh, is equally helpful for all the teachers in our sample, uh, but the teachers of, of color were more attentive and attuned to the fact that that was something that would be of benefit. Um, and in many cases, again, that was a place where teachers told us they felt they hadn't received adequate preparation. So given that the teachers we talk to enjoy and value their work, and given that most of them intend to stay in the field over the long term, what is it that keeps them engaged? We asked the teachers to rate a variety of different characteristics that a school or early elementary classroom might have, and then asked them to rate the relative importance of those characteristics in picking a place in which to work. And given the concerns that teachers expressed about the, the bureaucracy, paperwork, the burden of administration and standards and testing that they felt weren't necessary, it's perhaps not surprising that some of the things they prioritize most in choosing a school or classroom are having school leaders who trust and support teachers and having supportive coworkers and administrators. Um, having that sort of collegial environment in which teachers are listened to and in which those administrative burdens are not as great uh, is something that uh, obviously many of them value very highly with upwards of 70% rating it extremely important. But as you look at this list, basically everything that you see here, uh, we have upwards of four and five K through three teachers telling us that it is at least very important. So all of these things are, are valued to greater or lesser degrees. You'll note that at the bottom of the slide, we have having teachers who are well compensated. So pay, um, while there still are 85% who are rating it as very important and almost half as extremely important, in relative terms comes in lower than the, the type of uh, environment in which the teachers will be working and the degree to which they feel supported. When we asked a similar question of our early childhood educators in the prior survey, um, what really stood out was the degree to which on almost every single characteristic, the early childhood educators 
rated it even more important than did the K through three educators. Um, looking across this slide, you'll see for everything listed here, except for the two items at the bottom, the importance placed on that item was at least 10 points higher among the early childhood educators, and in some cases, more than 20 points higher. Um, and that may reflect uh, a higher degree of dissatisfaction with some of these things among early childhood educators. They may be feeling like they have to struggle more to find a classroom that meets some of these standards. There were a couple of places where K through three educators offered a higher rating than uh, zero to five educators did on the importance of, of some of these issues. The only one that was really significant is the one you'll see at the bottom here, appropriately serving children with special needs. Uh, K through three educators prioritized that about eight points higher than did the early childhood educators. So what could be done to potentially provide the support that uh, teachers would want to stay in the profession long term? We tested a variety of policy proposals that might be put forward to help support early elementary teachers and asked them to indicate whether they thought each one would be a good idea or a bad idea. Uh, overall, everything we presented them with was pretty thoroughly embraced by K-3 teachers. The blue bars here represent the proportion that thought each of these was a very good idea. The red bars is somewhat good, and then the total is running down the right-hand side. So we've got roughly nine in 10 K through three educators who are saying that increasing pay, requiring principals and other district leaders to understand developmentally, de developmentally appropriate practices um, for young children, um, building public perceptions about the value and importance of early education, and then improving mentoring and support services. All would be uh, good ideas, and majorities in each case indicate that they think it would be a very good idea. The one place where we saw a notable split in the perception of K through three educators was the last item that you'll see on this slide. Um, expanding alternative certification options to recruit teachers without a standard education degree. 44% think that's a good idea, but a 56% majority uh, either indicated they thought it was a bad idea or said that they were neutral on that front. The only place where we had less than half who indicated that they thought the proposal was a good idea. And there were a number of places where we saw some distinctions between different subgroups of K through three teachers in the ways that we evaluated uh, these ideas. As you'll see on the upper right hand side, teachers of color were about twice as likely as white teachers to say that expanding alternative certification options would be a good idea. In relative terms, though, compared to the other policy proposals we put forward, uh, even teachers of color ranked it as the least important or the least broadly supported of all of the ideas that were put forward. So um, this, I think, uh, provides a sense of what teachers think about the work that they're doing today, um, some of their aspirations for sort of improving the support they're getting and, and making their work easier. Um, and we've drawn some comparisons between what the K through three educators think and what early childhood educators think. I'm gonna hand it over to Lori now to start walking through the degree to which teachers perceive connections between the work that they do and the work that those educating children under five do. Thank you, Dave. Can you hear me all right? I hope. <laughs> yes. So, great. I, all right, so I was having some te technical difficulties earlier, but I think I got it worked out. So when we actually sat down and talked to educators, one of the things that we tried to understand was the connections that they held between earlier grades and higher grades. And we'll talk a lot about a sort of unified system and how they feel about that in a second. But we just want to understand basically what were they considering when they looked at sort of that spectrum from birth into those higher grades. And those teachers told us that they could see some things were very much in common. Uh, sort of the roles that they play, especially with early childhood educators, that nurturing role, looking at higher grades and that accountability role. But one thing that was very clear and consistent in both ways was how they saw this as sort of a progression of learning and that those early childhood educators are teaching the building blocks for K through three, same role for K through three educators teaching those building blocks for the higher grades and sort of learning, building on learning was very clear throughout. Um, we also asked those K through three educators whether they thought of themselves as an early childhood educator. So um, over two thirds said, yep, 
that's totally me. That fits my definition of myself. Um, but you can see there's a very clear difference. On the right-hand side, it was those kindergarten teachers who are very much driving that perception and that identification as an early childhood educator begins to decline uh, with each grade level. So that by third grade, it's just a bare majority that are telling us indeed they see themselves as an early childhood educator. Um, we also asked them what the minimum required level of education for the lead teacher working with children from birth to age five in a preschool or whatever setting um, should have. Um, a majority are telling us that they feel they should have a bachelor's degree. It was only one in 10 that felt like they should have an advanced degree. Um, that was less than half who simply went for an associate's degree as sort of the most appropriate level for that lead teacher. Um, now, why did they feel like they ought to have some of the same educational requirements? Um, you can see some of the exact responses that they we pulled out, um, some examples here. Um, they were sort of illustrative of some of the themes that we heard, um, many of them saying that it's vital to understand the development in early childhood so they know what's appropriate to do for each level. Um, and just sort of that flow of laying the first those building blocks that we just talked about that they all sort of recognize, they ought to be knowledgeable as well as certified. So we heard that um, throughout much of that data. Um, so we wanted to give them a, a real clear juxtaposition of two viewpoints. And we laid out um, the exact language that you can see here, and they could choose between the two. Of course, these were rotated, so there wasn't any sort of um, bias in which way that they heard them. Um, but they came down pretty adamantly on the side that we need to have more aligned early care and education pathways from birth to third grade. Um, and we said that was for a number of reasons, increasing the level of respect, ultimately compensation for those educators, and just giving them a little more verbiage around that concept versus the idea that it wasn't really going to work, um, that teaching babies is really different than teaching a third grader, and a, a little more verbiage around those concepts. But again, we had three quarters that these teachers that were more likely to agree with that rationale that we really ought to have a unified and aligned system. Now, if we split that out and look at um, specific age groups, you can see that when we ask about the comfort level of being in a unified system themselves for those kindergarten through third grade teachers, um, how comfortable do they feel um, being aligned with children, uh, teachers of children who are in preschool, ages three and four, versus those who are um, early childhood educators, for instance, and toddlers? And there is a clear distinction there. Um, it's more than three and five that say they're comfortable. In fact, a third that are very comfortable if our age groups are um, sort of that preschool age groups versus just a bare majority of 55% Although the intensity of that view doesn't really change um, dramatically, it's still three in 10, feeling very comfortable even for birth to age three. Um, now, again, we see that kindergarten teachers, um, just as we just pointed out, are uh, uh, the sort of level of educator that was most likely to be comfortable in a unified system, whether that was for those preschoolers or for infants and toddlers. And then we got that drop off in comfort level, especially when we were getting into those grades, um, second and third grade levels, um, that we just tend to start drawing distinctions once they're, once those educators are in those somewhat upper grades. Um, uh, interestingly, white teachers were somewhat more comfortable with a unified system than those um, educators of color, and teachers with advanced degrees were some of the most likely to feel comfortable with that. Again, that self-perception, that identification, which again goes back to what grade level they're teaching, but again, just thinking of yourself as an early childhood educator, there was a 20-point difference in being more comfortable, um, for example, from any time birth through third grade. So um, we definitely saw some distinctions among educators. It wasn't just sort of this general picture, but there was also some um, sort of common reasons why they felt that way. 
So for those who said they'd be more comfortable, um, really it comes down to sort of two things. Um, I say there's sort of the sharing aspect and there's a consistency aspect. Um, so whether it's that idea that experience and knowledge and just background that they could share with each other would be helpful, um, that idea of learning from others and exchanging of ideas would be better if they're in this type of unified system. And again and again we heard about sort of this ability to share across grade levels. And then that idea that consistency, having, um, having sort of the same standards or uniform standards, um, teachers sort of having the same training, um, being able to work with all different ages, that that um, consistency was going to be, uh, was one of the reasons that they felt like this would be a good idea. The things that, um, <laughs> it was interesting, some of the things that they said in terms of being uncomfortable, was simply, um, they got really personal. They said, I don't want to work with that age group, or that age group is too young. You know, I teach third grade. I don't want to work with infants. Um, so they personalized it really quickly. Um, there was also a sense that um, the qualifications might be different, or potentially they were saying they should be different, um, and people might not be experienced to be able to flow among those different age groups. Um, uh, simply that they might be in different physical settings and, and the developmental aspects might be very, very different um, for working in that broader spectrum. So those were some of the reasons they provided for why they might not feel um, comfortable with that idea. And you can just see a few of those examples of what we heard in terms of different ages requiring different academic rigor or just being able to relate um, from an infant up to a, a grade three. So lots of different um, aspects to this issue that people were bringing up. Um, now we did give them some potential um, benefits uh, that might come out of such an er a unified early childhood system, or I should say outcomes really, uh, and asked them how important those would be. Would those be extremely important, very important, somewhat important, or simply not important? Now mo the vast majority of people were actually telling us that they're at least very important. And you can see inside that blue bar, the proportion that we're telling us that was an extremely important potential outcome from this type of a unified system for the educators to serve children from birth to third grade. Um, not shockingly, given the national conversation, of course this was done prior to this big national conversation about wages for teachers, but that, that was such top among teachers, they were all too familiar with this idea um, well before this. Um, higher wages for teachers, 88% said so that would be extremely or very important and basically on the same level there, greater level of respect uh, was something that they pointed to. Um, as well, we heard about more developmentally appropriate standards for students. In fact, um, the vast majority, 92%, said that that would be extremely or very important. In fact, all of these really are, are things that people thought of as important outcomes of this potential unified system. Again, it's important to note that distinction that we saw in terms of whether they um, felt like the unified system and agreed more with the rationale for a unified system versus not having it, um, that we did really clear, clearly see a distinction between those kindergarten teachers, 87% um, of whom agreed with the idea of having a unified system, but it was you know, more than two-thirds of every single level the weakest, again, among those in uh, teaching third grade. Um, so uh, another sort of bucket of questions that we asked in, in many of these uh, different surveys really related to um, advocacy. I can see a really wonderful quote here <laughs> regarding uh, having the power and being able to make this sort of a difference. So we asked a number of questions across various surveys. Um, one with teachers, um, asking them, of, of teachers of children uh, in kindergarten through third grade, and asking them if they felt like um, that their work would be improved if quality early childhood education was available to more children. Uh, there's no question in their minds that it would. In fact, um, almost two-thirds said it would be greatly improved. Almost everyone said it would be at least somewhat improved among these educators. Um, but we also note that when we talk to voters, 
as Dave mentioned, across the uh, various aspects of this research, the teachers in K through 12 were one of the most powerful from uh, uh, communicators about issues related to funding for early childhood education. Four and five voters indicated that they would trust um, what teachers in K through 12 schools said about this. Um, which was higher than obviously any of the other groups that we tested, although really they weren't dismissive of any of these. But they were really powerful advocates, even slightly more so um, than asking them about former preschool teachers or young people wanting to pursue a career in early education. Um, the idea being that those um, that those teachers in K through 12 would really understand the power um, that early childhood education had on how kids start kindergarten and start uh, those, um, <laughs> excuse me, those years of education in elementary school. Um, so we wanted to look at three different audiences here where we asked the exact same question and asked them how interested they would be in getting more personally involved in adv advocating for increased access to high quality early childhood education. So the first column on the left there you'll see is those kindergarten through third grade educators. Then we've got our early childhood educators from birth to age five. Then we've got our um, parents. So uh, you can see though that our K through three educators are some of the least apt um, to tell us that they'd be personally willing. Again, it's still a positive result on that zero to 100 scale where 100 is um, extremely interested, 50 is sort of our neutral point. Most people are just not dismissing this out of hand. Um, but again, we do have a stark difference, especially when you look at the average response between our K through three years and our birth to age five on the educators with our parents being somewhat more like our birth to age five um, uh, uh, educators. Um, we also asked, again, same, same questions, a randomized battery, and ask them, okay, well, how willing would you be to take each of these following actions to help to advocate for that increased access to, to early childhood education in your community? Um, here's where we really see some stark differences. The, again, those birth age five educators on every single response category that we gave them, every type of action, were more likely than either K through three educators or even among those parents of kids in that age group than they were uh, to, to take each of these individual actions. And that was really irrespective of what that was. Um, but it is notable that for all of these, voting for a candidate or for a ballot ma measure in support of early childhood education was something that really rose to the fore for all three audiences and certainly going to have an opportunity to look into that um, coming up this November. Those actions that they were less likely to take, um, uh, attending a protest rally or demonstration uh, fell to the bottom for many audiences, uh, just uh, really tied with paying more in taxes for our birth age five educators and our parents. Um, so they were really drawing some distinctions in terms of what they were most apt to do, um, and uh, you know, but again and again, we saw those those uh, educators in that birth age five range the most likely um, to be willing to take any of those actions and and to be uh, wanting to advocate um, for early childhood education. So, Lori, that's a lot of data. Yes, <laughs> it is a lot of data. Lori and Dave, thank you so much for walking us through um, that. To your teams as well for helping us conduct all of that, um, all of that research. Both the quantitative and the qualitative have really enhanced our um, understanding of what's going on when people think about themselves as early childhood educators. We got just a few questions that we're going to walk through, um, and I encourage folks to put additional questions into the chat box. Um, if we don't get to one of your questions or you can't put it into the chat box right now but have a burning question, please feel free to email advocacy at naeyc.org and we will definitely get back to you. Um, we had a couple of questions about the, the who exactly were involved in the survey, how the focus groups were put together, 
um, and a little bit more in t about the demographic and geographic um, and grade splits of the teachers who were participating in the survey. And Dave, I was wondering if you could just give us a little bit of information about, a little more information about who these folks actually were. Sure, so on some of those uh, demographics that you listed, um, the geographic distribution was uh, pretty similar to what we see for the U.S. population, looking at it by census region. About a quarter of them came from the Northeast, uh, almost 3 in 10 from the Midwest, 3 in 10 from the South, and then 17% from the West, basically the Rockies out to the Pacific Coast. Um, a quarter of the respondents were current kindergarten teachers, 18% were current first grade teachers, 19% second grade teachers, and 21% third grade teachers. The remaining 17% of our sample were teachers who were currently in another grade but had taught in the K through 3 grades within the last couple of years. Um, and, uh, and then the, uh, in terms of ethnicity, 81% of the uh, respondents were white, 17% were educators of color. Great, thank you so much. Um, additional questions, and we will definitely get back to folks about um, if there are questions that we can't answer at this time. We had a couple of questions about folks who wanted to know where they could get the videos. Um, there are other, I say plural, there are other videos, one with parents talking about um, what their early childhood educators have meant to them. Um, we strongly encourage folks to make sure that they're following the America for Early Ed Twitter feed. Um, and on Facebook, you can find it at Support Early Ed. They've been tweeting out and posting on Facebook those videos. We encourage folks to share that, um, to share those videos as well, and to get there, to get those out there. Um, we will make the slide deck available um, in addition to the executive summary and other details that will be going up over time. Um, there will be a Twitter chat on this data in a couple of weeks on May 24th from 2 to 3 p.m., and we encourage folks to join us there as well. You'll be able to access the slides and the recordings um, at this via how you logged in. Um, and for folks who are listening to this via recording, you will be able to access the slides as well um, on, the same web, on the same site at which you got into the recording. They'll also be available on NAYC's website. Um, there were a couple of questions about what exactly do we mean by a unified, a, a unified certification and preparation system. And for all of those folks who want to know what it is that we're working towards in moving a unified framework of competencies and qualifications across the entire birth through eight workforce, across settings and across states. I strongly encourage everybody to engage with us at the Power to the Profession initiative. You can go online to naic.org slash profession and learn more about the goals of this collective initiative. As Rian said, we're part of a national task force of 15 organizations who have a stake in the early childhood profession from zero to eight um, and are working with states and communities and members of the early childhood profession and the field at large all throughout, um, all throughout the country who have been weighing in and sharing their thoughts and their feedback on the process so far. And as we continue to move forward towards this idea so aptly described in the Transforming the Workforce Report about having a profession that really works across what we know about the brain science and the developmental science um, that unifies this stage of life for children from zero to eight. Um, so if you have not already, please make sure you're able to, to join us um, at americaforearlyed.org and at naic.org slash profession. Um, Oh, I see a couple of other questions coming in. There are a couple of questions for NUIC about how this information will be used um, and what we'd like to do with this. And Rian, feel free to feel free to jump in. I'll say that we've really used the data and the information that we've thought so far, um, that we've received so far in our market research about 
how we really think about how we advance the profession when we think about voters. We've done a lot more work around our electoral advocacy. It's entirely nonpartisan, but really helping folks to think about how we make sure that candidates on both sides of the aisle are talking about and embracing early childhood education, what kind of messages work to motivate advocates um, to make sure that we are moving parents and educators to be on the same side of defining and demanding high quality early childhood education. And in this case is really helping us to think about as we're sort of moving towards a vision of a profession that does encompass zero to eight in a very real way, how do we talk to the K3 educators that are sort of in their own, that have been very much on their own, um, not in childcare settings, not in Head Start, not in family home providers, and how do we make sure that we're really talking to them and with them about what kind of preparation, compensation, um, structures really work for them to be part of this entire profession. Rianne, do you have anything to add about um, how we're really looking to use this data? Okay. We might have lost her. All right, we have time for just one last question. And thinking about sort of the advocacy related questions being focused on just zero to five early childhood education when other questions were sort of based on the entire unified zero to eight workforce. Um, we really wanted to think about what the goal of having, our, because we've seen so much support from the broader stake of voters about having the value of K-3 educators be advocates um, for early childhood education. We really wanted to hear from those educators themselves about whether they saw themselves as powerful advocates for early childhood education and to really assess their willingness and their capacity, what they would need to really engage as advocates for high quality early childhood education, because we know so much about how they emerge as trusted voices um, and the sort of need to have other, um, other groups of folks from K-12 to principals to superintendents sort of saying like, please, this is the group of folks that we need to invest in these are the people who we really need to say, you know, their compensation drives my outcomes and goals. Um, if you want to see high school graduation rates go up, we've got to invest in the pre preparation and compensation of early childhood educators. If you want to see third grade test scores go up, whatever your sort of goal is, these are the folks, not just high quality early childhood education, but the educators in particular, where we know sort of the nexus of quality lies, these are the folks that we need to invest in. So we will continue. There, there are a lot of questions coming in, which I think is wonderful. We'd love to continue this conversation with all of you, both on social media, directly, um, as we continue to have this conversation moving forward. We think there's a lot that we can do to help promote the importance of early education to families. Um, and there are some questions about sort of what we can do as advocates to make sure we do that. We hope that you all join NEYC and your affiliates. We know how important it is to be part of local communities um, that are working towards shared goals in your states um, and who are supporting the early childhood education work and the advocates, the folks who are doing the work on the ground each and every day. Um, so we hope that you all are part of the broader national organization as well as your affiliates and getting engaged moving forward that we're going to meetings um, like the child care development that we're celebrating things like a major increase in the child care and development block grant um, and using that money to really advance what we know happens in early childhood education and that we're really working to say these two folks these two groups that are so often divided from k3 educators to zero to five educators need to come together to fight for each other, to carry each other's water, to have each other's back as part of this unified profession. 
So everything from working in your community to make sure that your principals who are in your elementary schools are connected to the early childhood education settings in their community and really thinking about what transition looks like beyond this is a, beyond a one day school visit that sometimes happens and, and sometimes doesn't for really creating a vision of zero to eight early childhood education in the community that really moves it forward. So there are lots of things you can do locally at your state level and nationally to really be an advocate for early childhood education, though I know that many of us, <laughs> but judging from the surveys, rallies are not the things that people are going to go to. So there are lots of other ways to engage and become an advocate. Um, I encourage you guys to continue reaching out. Dave and Lori, any last thoughts about the data itself? No, it's been a great discussion. Thanks, guys. We really look forward to more. We hope everybody has a wonderful rest of the afternoon, and we thank you all so much for joining us today.